All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for showing up again after lunch. That's always good to see you come back. Uh, so we're going to talk about Rebecca. If there's any Rebecca's in the in the audience today, I apologize. We're not picking on you, but uh, Rebecca is the uh, one of the great acronyms that we in government like to use. It's uh, RBCA, and it stands for. There we go. Just want to leave you in suspense. There, Rebecca is risk-based corrective action. So what is risk-based corrective action? So conventionally, when we're looking at a cleanup or remediation, we're looking at how much mass of the contaminant can we remove? The risk-based corrective action kind of turns that around. And instead of how much can we remove, the question is how much chemical mass can we safely leave behind? And the key there is safely. This is not just a way to leave more behind, but a way to balance that with the uh, safety of the environment and human health. And how do we also ensure then that future generations know what we did and where we did it at? This isn't a new process. The Rebecca process dates back to the Superfund program when it was adopted in 1986. It was part of that evaluation manual. That was the first reference to it. It's been modified over the years. Um, 1990, ASTM actually came out with a standard for risk-based corrective action and a specific one for petroleum sites. And then in a couple of um, updates over the years, they've also added the inclusion of vapor intrusion, which is one of the risk pathways into that standard. So this isn't something new that we just came up with, but in the past, the department has used risk-based corrective action, but we've not had a standardized policy or procedure on how to go about that. We've done it on a site-specific basis, usually working with the consultant that's um, working on the site. So this is an effort for us to try to standardize that. So obviously in the pristine world, we'd remove everything and turn it back to pristine conditions, but that is not always the case. That's so still one of our goals when we can, but often we do have limited resources. We have limited technology to use to get to that point. And in some cases we end up doing more harm to try to get to that end point than by leaving some acceptable level of contamination in place. And this provides us a consistent scientifically defensible process or how do we determine where that line is? And we want it scientifically based, legally defensible, um, so we can use that across our various different programs and, and still substantiate that if we're challenged on that. That doesn't mean there's not some mechanism in there for, for decision-making. It's not a cookie-cutter process by any means. There are still decisions that have to be made, both by the consultant proposing this and by the department. So there, there is a bit of an art to it as well as strictly the science, but it does at least provide a framework to facilitate that discussion. Based on this very basic level, this is the conceptual model of risk-based corrective action. You start with the source of contamination. That source is linked by pathways to a receptor, and a receptor is something that could be harmed by that contamination. The example I've used here is for an underground storage tank of a petroleum product. That would be the source. Groundwater could be one of many different pathways. And the domestic water well would also be a pathway to the end user, uh, the consumer who's drinking or utilizing that water who would be our receptor. There's many different pathways to receptors and a lot of the focus of, of the discussion in the conceptual model of uh, using a Rebecca process is to think about those pathways. Some examples, ingestion of water or soil, vapor intrusion into indoor space or you know, ambient air uh, effects in the outdoor space, dermal contact with either water or soil, ingestion of contaminated biota or even exposure to that biota, potential plant uptake and exposure, groundwater discharge of surface water systems, and ecological receptors, which is any of the biota that's out there that could be harmed. A lot of the focus of the Rebecca process is usually focused on the human health component. That obviously is one of our, is, is our primary concern, um, but the ecological receptors are as well. And a lot of times those kind of get neglected. Our process does include ecological risk. And so that needs to be addressed um, as well. Two different mechanisms that you can utilize the Rebecca process. Uh, this shows the forward risk assessment. So this is basically answering the question, 
what is the risk for a given site condition? We have a site, we know what the current conditions are, what is the risk? And this walks you through the process. First, you have the environmental media, the concentration and the, the horizontal and vertical extent, the faint and transport of that media through the different pathways that creates an exposure to our receptors, which creates a toxicity, and that then is calculated as the risk or the hazard. That's the forward mechanism. Example of this would be, we have a site, it has very low levels. We think we could probably close the site based on the risk. We'll go through this process and determine if the current risk at the site is acceptable. The other way, way to use the Rebecca process is the backward risk assessment. And that is to answer the question, what site conditions would meet the given risk condition? So now we're working backwards, starting with a known risk, acceptable risk level, and working backwards to develop what those site conditions would be. And this would be such that we have a site, we know there's no more work to be needed, but we need to know what level do we need to clean, clean up to. And so this would end up giving you a site-specific condition or conditions that you would then need to meet in order to see closure to the site. Whereas the other, other one is where you start with your current conditions and determine if that site can be closed at that. So very similar, I mean, the, the, the math is the same regardless, but it's two different ways of looking at that. So some key components, if you're going to do a risk-based uh, corrective action, here's some things that you have to start with upfront. And I appreciate Brenda's talk this morning, talking about site characterization. She was looking at it from a, a more uh, reclamation side, from remediation side. It's every bit as important for, for this. Without a good site characterization, you can't develop that risk because if you don't know what you got, it's very difficult to tell what that risk is gonna be. And likewise, even if you are working backwards, if you don't know some of those site conditions, it's very difficult to tell what would be an acceptable uh, cleanup criteria. So obviously full delineation, that's very important. Uh, we want to have a stable plume so that, and uh, one of the particularly challenging parts is if you have utility corridors, then may cause it to be something different than your typical pregnant pancake of a plume that's sitting there. So um, the more complex your subsurface geology gets with either fractures, natural pathways, preferential pathways, or man-made ones through utility corridors, the more complex it becomes. And so the more you have to work on doing an adequate delineation. That means that it's not gonna be simply three borings to identify the, the farthest out perimeter of, of the plume. You're gonna to have to do a little more detailed work on that. And that leads into the site conceptual model. Tell us what's going on there. What do you think, which is, what's happening on the groundwater? Groundwater is always gonna be a, a critical pathway to evaluate. So what's happening there? What's happening on the surface? What do you have nearby? Um, this conceptual model of the site is gonna be really important. And then as part of that conceptual model, identifying those potential uh, receptors and the pathways to those receptors for both current and future land uses. Um, we have a tendency to look at the current land use and say, well, Nobody's living there. Nobody's built a house there at this point. But we have to remember, unless there's something that can close off that pathway from the future, we're going to leave this contamination in place. We have to think of what could happen on that site in the future. And we'll talk about a few different ways we can do that. The other question is, what are your endpoints? Now, as part of our process in developing this, we have pulled in a lot of the standard regulatory endpoints, such as our water quality standards, the published EPA MCLs or state MCLs and the regional screening levels. And so those are already incorporated into the calculator. Um, but if you're looking at something different that we haven't covered with that, you're gonna to need to know what that endpoint is. Sometimes that's not easy. For example, if we're dealing with emerging contaminants such as PFOS, right now we, for only a couple of the PFAS compounds, do we have good toxicity data? So you would not be able to do a risk-based corrective action for most of those PFAS compounds because we don't know what the toxicity is. And so we, we need to know what that endpoint is. Um, we also have to identify the cumulative effects. There is no one toxicity value for crude oil. It is toxicity based on the individual components and for oil, Particularly, we're gonna look at the BTEX components, 
and the PAH uh, components. I'm going to look at the cumulative toxicity of all those. And so, again, that increases the complexity of the analysis because you have to look at each of those individual parts and then also them all combined. And then finally, this isn't as useful. It can be used, but it's not as useful if there's no degradation. Part of what's so useful of this is you can use that time before that contamination reaches the receptors to account for natural degradation. If you don't have that, such as with salts, which we tend to deal with a fair bit, um, you may have some dilution in there. And if you can account for that, you can use that, but you're not gonna have the degradation that you would with a petroleum product. And so the benefits of using this aren't gonna be as significant as if you were looking at uh, a hydrocarbon or uh, organic solvents would be another example that would degrade. One of the best ways the consultants can simplify this process is you start crossing off pathways. You identify your receptors and you look at how does my contamination get from my source to my receptor and start crossing off ones that aren't there. It's an incomplete pathway. There's different ways you can do that. Perhaps it's because of natural site conditions. For example, if you have a clay aquitard underlying the source of contamination, that's going to restrict movement into a drinking water aquifer, then you can close off that, that pathway if you can show that that is a continuous layer and that's naturally occurring. You can also use administrative controls. These would be things such as the zoning that's in place or uh, ordinances if you're working in a city or a county um, or environmental covenants on the property that restrict future uses of that property. Now, obviously, because you're restricting future uses, the landowner of that property is gonna be integral into this process because they're gonna to, going to have to be involved in that discussion. The other option is to use engineering controls. The common one for this is if you have concerns with vapor mitigation, there's things you can do to the building itself uh, through an engineered system to close off that pathway or prevent that, that movement. So that's the first thing you're gonna look at is can we close off those pathways? If we can't close off a pathway, we have to calculate what that risk is. And only once we've calculated all those different risks, we'll know which one is really going to govern the uh, the cleanup. So this is not a quick and easy process. I guess that's maybe the point I'm making here. Is it's not something that's going to make it, sites just magically go away. But if you can put in the legwork to make a good case, using this process, they will be able to close some sites that would probably be very difficult to get to closure otherwise because of some of the restrictions we talked about. So it's after lunch. So I'm gonna be a little interactive here and we're gonna talk through kind of an example of a site. So picture the site. It's next to some rail lines. Let's see, I think I even got a pointer here. Picture site. Let's just say hydrocarbon contamination. We've got rail lines there. We've got some residential areas there, some roads, we've got a park there. So let's start off thinking we've got our source. What are some of our receptors? And let's just not even worry about the ecological receptors. Let's focus on human health receptors. What are our human health receptors? Just shout them out. Groundwater. Okay, groundwater would be a good pathway to what would be our final receptor there? The residents, yep, the people living in those houses right there, most likely. Could be people recreating in that park if there's wells there. Those could also be potential receptors. Other potential receptors. Surf exposure, people walking across the site, walking around the site, either recreating the site or just walking through. The, the other other potential receptor there could be people doing work on the site. If, if there's excavation or things being done there, that would also be a, a potential receptor. Anything else? What was that? Vapors, yes. So the, that would be a, another pathway to a receptor, uh, people just being in the area or even outside the area, the vapors could travel some distance. So yeah, let's talk about some of those pathways we've identified. So when we got groundwater as a pathway to um, a, a water well, either drinking or, or exposure. We've got vapors both in the air, potential vapors to the, the structures itself, dermal contact from people recreating on the site or people, uh, workers digging the site. Why is the difference to differentiate between somebody that might just be 
walking and playing on the site and somebody that's working on the site. The different toxicities because you have you could have little kids, you could have at risk people that are recreating there. Workers, we make some assumptions as to age, and uh, um, that can affect what we could use for a toxicity value there. Um, what would be one of the problematic pathways that I that you'd be worried about on this site? And it may help you figure it out if I mentioned that this park here is called Roundhouse Park. This actually used to be a roundhouse, a railroad facility, an industrial site. So you could have lots of preferential pathways through utility corridors there. Some you may never, not even know about because of it was, you know, put in place long before one call was ever a thing. And so you're really going to have to do your due diligence in the delineation of that in order to know that we don't have a preferential pathway running along the right of way here that could be actually causing a even a very slim finger of that contamination to move move off in that direction. And that'd be one. And, and again, um, railroad right away, a lot of times we've got other utilities using those as well. So that would be one of the problematic areas that I would uh, be worried about. Now we didn't talk about, we not didn't touch on the ecological uh, receptors, but what about the consumption or human consumption of wildlife? Could that be a pathway? Yeah, that could be a pathway. How can we control that in this situation though? Considering that this is probably, in, this is in town, we'll say this is in town, that uh, if there's an ordinance prohibiting hunting in town, which there may be, or hunting within a certain distance of residences, which we know there is, then you could close that pathway because you would not be able to be hunting in, in that area. So you could cross that off the list fairly easily. And that's kind of how the analysis would go, identifying the receptors, the pathways to those receptors, crossing off the ones you can, and then you look at what you have left. And you, you make the decision, do we calculate them? Do we close those pathways through one of those control methods that we mentioned here? Or do we, do we calculate it and, and determine what level we have to clean up to? Any questions or any other thoughts on this? on our little example site here. Yes, future, that good example, good, good thought there is. So that, we kind of talked about current, um, current things, but if you look here, there's some streets. It looks like that may be an area for future development, the way the city's planning there. And so we would need to look at future uses as well. So is there, is there zoning restrictions or do we need an environmental covenant to prevent, say, a house with a basement? or other types of development. Maybe we want to restrict that area so that um, there's not a school or, or some other type of uh, or park or something placed over that contamination. And so that's a, a good thought where we have to look to those future uses as well. Other thoughts, comments? A little bit on the timeline. And so we've been working on this, what's it been, Shannon, a little over a year to develop this Rebecca process. We, we use a consultant with uh, some familiarity developing these Rebecca processes for many other states. Um, and so you might see some similarities with, with other states, which is, is fine. Again, there's a standard ASTM standard for the process. So the process should be uh, familiar if you've done this um, in other places. Um, we'll be publishing our documents, the, the instructional documents, the Excel calculator that goes along with that on our website. I'll say this week. It may not go up exactly right away tomorrow, but this week sometime. And so those will be available for you to download and, and look at and, and peruse and see what questions you may have. We're still training on it. We're going to be doing some additional training with the, at the DEQ in March as we're still learning as well. Um, and then I would like to hear feedback from those that may be using that as a tool, what you feel is necessary for training. Um, do you, there may be a handful that want the deep dive, getting right into the calculations. Others may want just a um, shallower level to look at. Here's what it is, and here's how you would take it to your in-house risk assessor and deal with and present them uh, the information to do their magic. 
So uh, looking for feedback on training needs and what everybody would um, appreciate on that after you've had a chance to look at it. But we can really just begin discussing some of these sites at any time. If you have ones that you've been anxiously waiting, knowing we're developing this, we can start talking about those now anytime. So um, bear with us as we work through the first few. It will take a little longer as we're learning as well, but uh, we'll get up to speed and then uh, that should simplify the process for everybody. So again, our goal with this is to take a difficult problem and rather than finding a solution that really only makes things worse, to find a good compromise that, that meets uh, the needs of um, being a reasonable cleanup and also being protective of public health and the environment. So with that, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Sure, we, we can certainly look at existing sites. Um, with that, if the sites have obviously already been closed, they're closed, um, we're not going to go back and reopen anything. But if you have a site you're currently working on, yes, we can look at utilizing this, understanding that, yep, we've, we may, you may be backtracking a bit in order to um, get the necessary information, but we can, we can look at that. For existing open sites, we, we can, yes. Yeah, if we have sites that are still open, we can apply this to that. And keep in mind, this, this is not a requirement. You do not have to use the Rebecca process. You can still, basically the, well, you can be using the Rebecca process, but the tier one levels are basically what we've utilized in the past. If you reach clean up for that level, you, you're done. You don't have to go through the calculations on that. So, um, so that's still an option. You don't have to use Rebecca. If you think there'd be a benefit in using that for a site that is remaining open, um, yes, we can, we can have that discussion. Look at that site and see if we can uh, utilize it for that. 